for this episode of Advanced Pretend. I'm so happy to be able to share um, some knowledge from my friend Kevin Walsh, who is a classically trained chef and a um, a chef who's in the food landscape right now as um, a person who designs menus and creates meals for um, the elderly community. Um, he travels a lot to do it and He's um, got some tricks in his back pocket as a former Four Seasons chef, um, kind of the high level of fine dining in that um, hospitality arena that is um, pretty exclusive. And so those experiences have deeply shaped, um, you know, what Kevin does today. But Kevin is uh, one of those people, I think, as a chef and just as a person with um, an inclination toward trying new things. Um, he doesn't tire of uh, his love for food and he he doesn't tire um, of making food for others. Um, to at the very end of our conversation here, he said something to me like, I just have to keep doing it. I, I cook all day at work when I'm working and I come home and I cook all night. And um, cooking for uh, three kids and um, his, his beautiful, lovely wife, Amelia, and just kind of being in the world as a person who's enthusiastic about food and um, loves to share it. So yes, uh, once again, we have do have a culinary artist here in Advanced Pretend, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Thanks very much for showing up again. <laughs> Today we're talking with Kevin Walsh, who has been friends with me for a long time. Every time I just start doing, I start calculating stuff like that in my head, Kevin, about people I've known a long time, then my age comes into play and then I have to stop doing the math. So it's been a long time. <laughs> and um, we met because you used to live here in Teton Valley with your beautiful wife, Amelia, who's also a, a dear friend of mine and worked at the Four Seasons as Sue. Sous chef, I uh, actually moved up to executive sous chef when I was in Santa Fe. So, oh right, yeah. And so, um, you've been a chef for since how for how long? Well, I've been in the kitchens for since I was sixteen. So that's going to age me a little bit. Started off washing dishes. <laughs> okay, all right. And I'm curious about that. Like, that's the kind of the stuff I want to dig into with you. Is like. So you started working in kitchens when you were a child. I mean, 16 is still a kid. Um, and is that is that was that accidental or re, did you want to go and work in food? Or, or were you just like, hey, this is an easy job. I need money. I'm a, I'm a teenager. Teenage, first teenage job. Yeah. Right. A buddy that, that worked at the same place. And he's like, hey, come. I got you a job here. And I was like, okay, I'll try it out. And it's it, just washing dishes. You know, that's, that was my job for a while. And it was so funny, like how that, how it moved into me cooking was really one of the guys that was prepping. He was just chopping onions and he's like, Hey, can you help me out? And I was like, sure. Grab a knife and start hacking away at some onions, you know, and, and I had something about it, it just triggered. And I it's just like, I do, I want to do this. I like food. And you know? Yeah. And so prior to that, as a, as a kid, did you just want to be a fireman or? <laughs> no, I wanted to be a golfer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to be a mermaid. <laughs> Still want to be a mermaid. You wanted to be a golfer. A golfer, yeah, yep. Are you good at golfing? Decent. I, I could have been pretty good, but uh, yeah, I started working. <laughs> so yeah. Um, that's really funny because I have another good chef friend who's also a golfer. Is that a thing? I must be. <laughs> I know a lot of chefs that are golfers too. So really, oh my god, that's so funny. Great. Okay, so so at sixteen, you're in in the workforce, <laughs> washing dishes, and the the term the word work really does apply. I th I mean, kitchen work is grueling, Kevin. Yes. And chopping skills. Okay, you started with an onion, and you know that actually. I remember there's a scene in um the movie about julia child with meryl streep and she's at the cordon bleu and and she's just like i'm gonna get after this goddamn onion you know and she just it, it's one of her i don't know if it was fictionalized but it was kind of like this um just demonstration of how you know one thing could torture you as a culinary kind of um, professional and in her um in the infancy of her 
her starting that career, it was the onion that busted her chops. And so she was like, I'm just going to chop a mountain of this. <laughs> so what kind of moments have you had in the kitchen where you, you felt like at times you're not going to beat me. <laughs> and it has, it had to be about like a method. There's so many times it's, you know, like sometimes you're, you're just in the kitchen and you're just in the weeds, you know, that's, that's how we say it, you know, where, where you just have tickets just flying off of the wheel and, you just can't keep up. There's no way of keeping up. And it, <laughs> but you, you get through it. You push through it. You just one ticket at a time and you keep moving. And that's that's but it happens all the time, you know, and any almost any restaurant I've worked at, it's just it gets crazy, it gets busy, you're hot, you're tired, you know, you've already worked twelve hours that day and, and that ticket machine is just rolling still. <laughs> Holy moly. And you know, really it is um also part adrenaline rush. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you just, you just get moving, you know, <laughs> all of us cooks, we basically live off of caffeine and nicotine. So it's, you know, that's, that's how we get through the day. <laughs> no nicotine for you, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about kind of like how you did climb up through those steps that you might take to get into a higher position in the kitchen um, what, uh, smaller restaurants did you work for? I think this is the part I don't really know. I met you when you were in the hospitality industry and now you're working in a different environment, which we'll talk about later. But, um, at the beginning, well, you know, you did in fact have a formal culinary education. Uh, well, not when I started washing dishes. No, I was. No, uh, I mean, you got into it finally. You did go to school. Oh yeah. That's, uh, I went to, I was. I worked for this place, this small restaurant is in the Midwest. It's called Carlos O'Kelly's. It's like a Tex-Mex type of type of restaurant. That's where I started. And okay. uh, for a few years and and even just working hard there, like by the time I was 18, they were wanting me to be a supervisor. And so kind of just push your way through it. You know, just hard work pays off. Right. Uh, then uh, I was in community college and there was a guy he's like i'm gonna go to the culinary school it's in scottsdale it's awesome they buy your knives they teach you everything and i was like that's awesome i want to do that <laughs> you know and at that point i was already uh into uh, the food network back back in the day when they actually cooked food on the food network you know oh yeah those were the days <laughs> <laughs> and like in tv right the music. oh my god i mean emerald was on he, yeah where did he go he just like vaporized i don't know where he went the two hot tamales. You know. Oh, right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So you were super into the kind of media food culture that was kind of growing at the time, really kind of booming. Yeah. The start of the boom there. And mm. I loved it. You know, I mean, I the first meal I ever made at home was a box of mac and cheese. And I was like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm going to do this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, when, uh, yeah, at the right age of uh, 20, moved out to Scottsdale and, and, and went to the culinary school and and loved it ever since. You know, I just, it's something I'd never change, you know. Right. And I wanted, I wanted to ask you, I thought about this prior to the interview too. Um, how many years of matric matriculation is that? Is that a, is that a two year? It was a 15 months. It was a one year. At okay. School. And so they must, they go through kind of chapters they put you into modules, right? And so did you have a favorite? Uh, honestly, I think Saucier was my favorite one. I love making sauces and soups and, and things like that. That really brings brings dishes together. It's it's kind of a nice, and it's it's a food of love thing. You know, like when you're making a sauce, you, you start with your stock, you know, you roast your bones and you, you make the stock and it's hours and hours of doing that and then turning that stock into something beautiful by adding just a couple ingredients to this. Right. Don't you think the best flavors are like simplest? Like the, you don't have to go crazy. <laughs> it takes time. It's, it's, it's doing, taking the time to do it right. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. I need to make a note here. I'm just going to write down talk to Kevin about soup. Separate conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I love soup. And, um, I've been trying to master on my own, against my own criteria, Italian wedding soup, which I love to make from scratch. And I, I think I have a couple of other home cooks in my life where they're like, God, those meatballs are a pain in the ass, Jen. I just don't know what you're even talking about. And I'm like, the payoff. Yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> and I, and tiny meatballs are like kryptonite to me in soup. It's like, yeah. if they're there, I'm in. Like it has to be, you Once know. It, it's all there and it tastes delicious. It's like, yes. It's yes. And I love making my own stock. I love to boil the carcass of a chicken and just add, you know, celery, fresh vegetables to that and really cook it down and freeze it. And um, it just so, serves you so well in the future, you know, and, and, and uh, saucier, it's such an important role in the kitchen because sauce lens, it's just the, the basic foundation to so much on the plate. And do you have a favorite sauce? I don't know. Uh, you know, making a good demi gloss is kind mm. of you, that one really takes almost three days to make. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> this it's a beef it's a beef stock that's you you just you roast your bones real nice and you add it in with some like nice roasted vegetables and some tomato paste and red wine and you just let it simmer for for a day. Strain it out, and I'll add more water to it, and I'll let that cook for another day. And then right. I'll take wash this and add them together, and then just reduce it down till it's a thick. Oh thick. man, the time that's invested in that—it's such. I uh, mean, gosh, you know, you can't take shortcuts when you're doing something that well, right? Not at all. <laughs> you can taste it if, if you take a shortcut. You can taste it. Hey, I love that input. I'm gonna write that down too. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think we all take shortcuts, but, it, you know, a, a lot of what we like to talk about here on the podcast is um, the way that creativity does slow you down, but it's a good way. You know, creativity takes time. Then, you know, includes art. And um, as we talk to artists here and we talk to writers and we talk to culinary um, artists as well, just like yourself. And and the fact of the matter is, uh, it is within our innate, you know, our innate makeup as humans includes creativity. And where is it within each of us? So as a culinary professional, you are called in to be creative all the time. You have to create menus. And certainly at the Four Seasons, you're doing traditional stuff, but also creating your own dishes because you want to make your mark and you want to you know, go with the seasonal flavors and those kinds of things. Also, yeah, reaching into your back pocket and always knowing um, intuitively what's in season. You know, what do you look forward to in the seasons, Kevin? What's your favorite time of year to cook based on what's available? It's it's a it's a real toss up for me. I mean, spring obviously you get <clears throat> all the fresh stuff that's just starting to pop out of the ground. Your ramps and oh, your ramps. Ramps and fresh garlic that's just coming up. You know, that's it's fantastic, but also I love fall as well because having all the squash and those hearty dishes like that, that, you know, just you just want to put a sweater on and just have a nice, nice bowl of soup, you know, and the, yeah, the fresh stuff that just came out of the ground, you know, like awesome potatoes that you know just grow down the road, you know, and yeah, right. And um, I also love that you, I think you and I share um, kind of a favorite flavor profile. I asked you once, what was your favorite flavors to cook? And you said Asian. I do like Asian food. Yes. And then you told me to go buy some black sesame seeds. And I was like, who cares if they're black? What is the difference? <laughs> yeah, just play around with it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you were like, Jen, just <laughs> Just do what I tell you. Just go get some black sesame seeds. But yeah, I mean, I think um, also too, uh, when in regard to um, being a chef and having your own tools in your toolkit and your knives and such, um, do you have a preference in knife that you could share with the audience that might be approachable for them? I know you have to invest money in good um, cutlery, dude. Like you can't skimp. Talk about not taking a shortcut. You know, you, you got to like really throw the cash at the, at the blades, but um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you prefer at a knife. And if there are any brands out there that you would recommend just to give it a try. You'll laugh at this one. <clears throat> I go to Bed Bath & Beyond and get a good $20 knife and sharpen it. <laughs> <laughs> That's, a sharp knife is the only knife you need. <laughs> good sharp. That's it's the best <laughs> input on the planet. I'm like, he's going to say worst off. <laughs> whatever you like good german steel knife is a good one you know but but yeah just as long as it's sharp that's 
<laughs> that's all I could, the best advice I can give you. Right. Sure. Uh, yeah, that is a really good point. And I think that if you do invest in something um, and if it's expensive, you're doing it mostly for longevity, <clears throat> that those kinds of things are supposed to last a really long time. But ultimately, you're doing the same thing with that expensive knife you bought. You've got to keep it sharp. Yeah, but- I still have some of my knives from uh, culinary school. Yeah. 20 something years ago. Do you have knives in your kit, Kevin, that you're attached to in a sentimental way? I've received some knives as gifts, you know, from some vendors, you know, they, they'll like engrave our, our names in it, you know, like a couple of our sous chefs, you know, we'd get some knives, you know, those are kind of fun. Those are the those ones. Are nice. And, and do you have any superstitions surrounding your, um, your tools? Uh, if you use it, just put it back. <laughs> so many tools go missing in kitchens, and I think any chef will tell you the same thing. But no, not really. It's, it's you know the, the tool tools for the jobs. You know, I mean, a carpenter needs a hammer. You know, like it's <laughs> exactly knife. You know, but yeah, I mean, I'm surprised you don't have more of like a high level kind of Batman tool belt. You do with respect, yeah. I don't know. That's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um it really interests me um kind of like in the in the artistic professions what what you have to hold in your hand to get the job done you know what i mean like from paintbrush to pen to knife <laughs> too many other things because there are so many artistic explorations out there and the people that are creating are you know doing it because they love it and um you must love it, Kevin, because you've spent so much time in the culinary profession, and now you're working with a very specific diner audience. Can you tell the uh, Can you tell the advanced pretend audience, the audience of five people that we really love, um, what you're doing right now with with your skills? No, I'm actually working with the, the elderly care. It's it's fantastic. I. I... I truly love it. It's 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 just gratifying. It really is because we work with uh, it's a well, we use a pace is it's actually a government funded program, and so like who I'm feeding is it's I just know that they need it, and it's and it just it gives me that sense of you know I'm doing something for somebody, you know, by cooking for for everyone that's out there, and it's yeah, no, it's a fantastic program, and and uh, yeah, like I said, it's just super gratifying. And then also the, the schedule. I can't beat my schedule, you know. <laughs> I'm not working weekends and holidays, and it's it's such a great game changer for me, you know. I actually get to spend time with the family, and yeah. Right, and you're also um, on the road a lot. Tell me more about that. I mean, you just told me yesterday, hey, I hope we're still recording at 11. I have to catch a plane at 3 to Virginia. Like, what's up with that, dude? Trip is Santa Fe. This is a. This oh, is a, sorry. Yeah, Virginia's later this month. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I just got back from uh, South Dakota, actually. But uh, no, it's I. I go for various reasons. You know, sometimes they just need help. Uh, sometimes I'm training a new manager or uh, training a new staff or getting things just in line. Sometimes uh, just covering vacations. You know, it's just kind of what what is needed. You know, but. I enjoy it. I really do enjoy the traveling. It's, I don't know, something about doing the whole airport experience and just going there and trying new foods in all these new cities. And it's, it's, yeah, that's. Do you get time, you get time off enough to go explore and, and, and try things that. For the most part, yeah, for the most part. Yeah. What's been your favorite recently? Any, anything come to mind? Uh, Well, I'm going to Santa Fe and there's a place I love down there. It's called Jumbo. It's a Caribbean African restaurant and it's actually he's been on uh, diners drive-ins and dives and yeah it's a it, fantastic he, it's you you walk in and the spice is just smacking the face it's just amazing yeah everything he has there the goat stew the lamb stew all the curries it's uh, awesome. fantastic caribbean africa and like in the caribbean you can find cilantro that's like as big as your hand okay. like the leaves are like you know, there's so many different things that the tropics do to a vegetable or a plant. Like, <laughs> you know, that's just so lush and like on steroids almost. But yeah, the layers of uh, flavor and smell and that kind of, um, I guess, niche is pretty intoxicating. I can see why you would love it. 
actually that might be dinner tonight when I get down there. So we'll see. <laughs> so yeah, let's talk about that too. I mean, you have a family of five, three children. And again, your lovely wife, Amelia, can't uh, say it enough. She's pretty great. She is. I mean, <laughs> she's, she's the reason I am where I'm at. You know, she's Aww. kept level-headed and or she's tried at least, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, she's, her support has been, been so huge, you know, just, I mean, she's the chef too, you know, she, she went to culinary school. That's where we met. And yeah. So, I was going to bring that up. You did meet in Scottsdale and, at the know, same school. Yeah. He's a crazy pink haired chica from Idaho. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I'm this, this kid from Iowa, you know, <laughs> but uh, no, that's, she's been fantastic. And, 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 uh, you know, with the kids, you know, like it's, I didn't get all their, their birthdays off, you know, and Christmas is, I never had off, you know, and Thanksgiving, I was never able to, to enjoy with the family, you know, so we would always, she'd always make sure that we celebrated on a day off, you know, that I had during that week, you know, wow. it's, it's special for all of us. you know. Right. Yeah. She's a really thoughtful person. <laughs> Slightly. Yeah. We <laughs> like her. Um, and so at home with these, you guys are really two paired culinary minds. I mean, her culinary skills, skills still come into play. I mean, she's a, she's really into herbs and um, that kind of thing. And in fact, she was trained in um, in baking, right? We're the pastry chef. Please. Yeah. So she's like, she's the pastry chef and you're the, um, you know, the dinner course guy or whatever. That's a great pairing. But as far as like home cooking, um, what do you guys experience in the kitchen together? Is, is there a lot going on there that you can kind of enjoy as a family? Oh, yeah, definitely. We're always baking bread. She's always, there's always two loaves in the oven at least two or three times a week. <laughs> it's, you know, she's got her own sourdough started that she's got, she's had going for a little while. And so she's. She's really getting good at that. So we need to write that down. <laughs> and it, no, uh, oh my gosh. Keep keep going. Yeah. Talk more about bread. <laughs> bread. Bread. And you should hear about her pesto bread that she made the other day. It was so good. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. We had the basil from that we froze from last year's basil plants and we used it in the bread. And it's, oh, it's so good. It's oh man sorts of things she did a blueberry bed one time and she's done she does so many different types but yeah and then as far as meals as a family are the kids in the kitchen with you guys yeah definitely the two youngest they they definitely more of the culinarians on, on that in that sense uh yeah jameson actually he took a uh pro start class it's a basically a cooking class at his high school and did a great job doing that you know he uh, he secretly loved it, I think, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's funny because I would quiz him, you know, because he'd be taking tests on sanitation and things like that. I'd, I'd of course, just drill him with all these questions that I know he's going to get on the test. And he's like, I know, Dad, <laughs> the high school kid coming. Out. I know everything. <laughs> That's great. And so do you see um, potential there that maybe at least one of your children might go into the culinary profession? We Possibly, you know, I've always tried to steer them away from it, you know, like I'll teach you how to cook, you know, cause it's a life skill that you need to have. Yes. But you saw what I went through, you know? Yeah. I mean, your kids bear witness to um, the grueling nature of the job because you come home wiped out and then you're not there for, as you kind of mentioned, I, we get to celebrate things, but not on the day necessarily that it's happening, you know? So that can be challenging for a kid. I mean, it sounds like you guys are, you know, kind of, you know, massaged it into a, a more palatable experience. So it, it was always happening. But yeah, um, I can see that in, in um, chefs that have kids, like, especially if you're a restaurant owner um, right. and then kind of being raised in a restaurant, but also seeing how hard it is. It is just so difficult. And I don't know. You you must really love it, Kevin, to hang in there for so long and to have been in so many roles. It's just, I don't know, it's just the, the simple rewards that just make it so, <clears throat> just so nice. You know, I think the the best compliment I ever had was when I was actually up in Jackson Hole and uh, we had an open kitchen and there's a table <clears throat> and there's this guy, he, was, he brought in some friends and you can tell he's kind of showing off, you know, bringing his friends in and, and just having a good time. And you can tell he was, he was like, 
couldn't wait to let the let the his friends enjoy the experience. And uh, I'd made a special that day. It was a tuna dish, I think. And uh, he ordered that. <clears throat> but like, <clears throat> I just I saw him take that first bite and just just the euphoria almost, you know, and on his face. And he's just, he just that was the best compliment I've ever had. He didn't even say it to me, but it was just one of those. I see it. I see that he's enjoying this, and yeah. so that's that's what keeps me going. That's why it's why I keep on doing. It. Right, and then you know, uh, fostering the culinary memory. You know, I mean, meals mark our lives. Special yeah. occasions, graduation, rehearsal yeah. dinners. Celebration. There's there's food around. Right. And I mean, I did have another chef say it elevates the whole thing to a fetish level. And that's the truth, because I don't know, it, it's not just about the food. It's about who's at the table. What does a restaurant, what else is happening? What's going on with the atmosphere? Is the music too loud, which has been a problem recently? <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> and um, I had a commentary from another guest that was like, you know why they do that? They just want you to drink more. And I'm like, is that why? Because what? It's just, I don't know. You can't, you can't really have an intimate conversation in a restaurant anymore. What do you think about that? It's, it is kind of a challenge recently. People are talking about it. Yeah, and and, and I was, she was great. And, and especially the, she was doing the research on when she upbeat techno music doesn't make your food digest it's like that's really? right yeah yes. i was like that's crazy I've, I've never even i've never even thought about that but yeah it's something i definitely want to look into because that, that totally yeah i mean um and to the audience too this is the um we're referring to the episode on tatiana berman who is a um world-class concert violinist but also she um she kind of goes through some things that she likes to call the it's just called this project the power of sound and she talks about how music affects you, sound affects you on a cellular level. So what Kevin's saying is she she did refer to the fact that, you know, they want you to drink more and they're going to turn up the music and it's going to be techno, but it's affecting your body on a really negative level and your food isn't digesting properly. So uh, it's a long-winded way of saying to all of you, go down the rabbit hole of Google and find out more because <laughs> what? <laughs> we all need to know more about that. What are What is it doing to us? Um but yeah, I do also so much like to talk about the farm to table stuff as well. And um, you're definitely um, in love with the seasonal produce stuff. And, you know, you had a lot of access to that at, at a fine dining level, you know, for the four seasons. Um, but you, for the culinary stuff, you trained in Scottsdale. And um, I, I mean, obviously they're, they're, they're training you by bringing in the food that you are going to see in the future. But I don't know. What was your favorite thing to make in the desert? Like, what is, what, <laughs> what is that about? I'm mean, like, when you're in a restaurant and you're sourcing stuff and you want to keep it local and you're in Arizona, what do you do? You know, cacti. There was, yeah. Yeah. Nopales. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and tomatoes. They had a lot of tomatoes out there. Ooh, I bet they were good too. Tomatoes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. The screen went away there. Uh, yeah, no, that was basically it. Tomatoes, lots of, you know, made a lot of salsas and chili, things like that. You know, that was kind of the, the staple of uh, Scottsdale. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, but you've traveled enough to other regions of the country and worked in th those different places where you've seen just a lot more. And certainly for Jackson Hole, what I do like to talk about the avail availability of gaming. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so what, were there any experiences you had um, at that level where you're preparing the game meet where you felt like you like scored a touchdown? Well, I mean, anytime you put duck in front of me, I'm... <laughs> oh my God, everybody loves duck, man. I'm like, what? it's the truth. So good. You know, I want to make a statement here about the fact that duck can be prepared incredibly poorly, though. And be. I have had to discussions with people about duck and they're like, well, it, it's awful. And I'm like, it wasn't prepared properly. How was it prepared? So let's talk about how you would um, treat a duck. Uh, what I love, well, <clears throat> I love the, the cooking process of sous vide cooking. And that's kind of, that's kind of like a foolproof way of making a, a solid duck breast. But inside that bag, I'll throw in lots of fresh uh, 
garlic and ginger and some fresh thyme and some juniper berries, <clears throat> salt, pepper, like, you know, kind of nice earthy flavors that really go well with that, that type of duck with the duck flavor. Mm -hmm. After you do that, you sear it and then a good, a nice cherry glaze, cherry sauce on top of that. You know, you, you're not going to go wrong. Maybe serve it with some nice goat cheese raviolis, you know, so you got to get that creaminess, your tart from the cherry, the gaminess from the, from the duck. Yeah. It's a great combo. I am great. so glad we're recording this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to play that over and over. <laughs> <laughs> What did you say about the cherries? <laughs> exactly. I want to see your picture of that after you make it this week, okay? Oh, so. my God. <laughs> oh, my God. It work, all right? <laughs> I once, uh, I think I commented on a, oh, I shared a Tom Colicchio post on Instagram to my stories. And he, and then, of course, his social media team saw it and I got all excited. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, now I have to make a standing rib roast because he saw my, he saw the share. But I don't know if I'll ever do that. <laughs> Standing rib roast sounds really hard. I don't it sound it's really good though. I don't know. Those kinds of challenges. I mean, as a home cook, it's like what you have to wait for an occasion to do it. I don't know if I should really believe in that. Yeah. Um but as a single person, why would I do it? Like I would have to plan something since <laughs> feeds 12 <told> people. <laughs> right. Uh, what do you make for uh holiday celebrations, Kevin? Uh Man, I, you know, Thanksgiving, you kind of have to stick with the traditional. You know, you do your turkey, your stuffing, but I do it all homemade, obviously. I'm not going to use the canned green beans and the canned mushroom stuff. No way. <laughs> you know, so obviously making everything from scratch, but doing like the classics, you know, from scratch. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else. You know, it's kind of depends on, you know, what, what holiday it is or what celebration it is, you know, mm -hmm. what type time of year it is you know a lot of people ask me what's my favorite thing to cook and it, it, it's i cook everything i i just i i don't have a one thing that i do all the time right I know, I make so much i do so many types of foods and right i mean you're in it because you love food in general like not just one thing or three what am I feeling that day? You know, do I want indian i'll go make some some curry or something Ooh, you know? i just love a good curry um can you tell me why you need to use a wooden spoon when you're making risotto? Uh, more for the metal on metal in the pan. There's you know just what? a whole lot of stirring and you don't, that's why? Creep up some of the metal bits and it'll actually turn your rice a little gray. Yum. So that, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Use a wooden spoon or a, or a plastic spatula or something like that to not scrape the bottom of the the dish right right and i i think i asked you that because um i disagree on thanksgiving i um i've made many varieties of turkey like i did a bacon coated turkey once and i'm sure you can imagine where you kind of coat it like a blanket and you like pin the bacon blanket on the turkey which i'm just trying to create a visual for people because i'm telling you it's super sexy but um i like to try new things on thanksgiving and in fact i just i made an entire paella once and realized, um, and exp my exposure to paella has a lot to do with living in Spain as a teenager and just the sheer sentimental value I find <laughs> in the paella. I can't help it. But I'd never made one and I, and I did pull it off, but it was like making a massive risotto. And the stirring, you don't, you never stop. Mm -hmm. And you better be ready and have everything good to go. Like, talk about prep work. Don't, don't cut any corners on that. And so, yeah, after that, um, I have never really made, I think I've made risotto one time and um, I really love it and um, certainly would like to do it on a smaller scale. So I thought I would ask you for some tips just because it's not that easy. And I think it's another one of those things. Um, it's one of those dishes that just cre uh, um, craves a lot of attention from you and you can't do it quickly. It's a slow, yeah. You got to take the time. Yeah, definitely. Right. And what other things can you tell me about how to pull it off better without being impatient and what to watch out for anything i mean it's the the basic you know you want to get your onions and garlic sauteed real nice with your rice and hit it with your white wine and make sure your stock is hot and ready to go so when you're adding it in slowly you know 
do that until it's it's cooked all the way. You know, it's, 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 there's no time limit or there's no, it's not going to be ready in 15 minutes or 20 minutes like a recipe is this. No, it's when it's done, it's done, you know, so give it that time and then finish it with uh, lots of butter and lots of Parmesan cheese and fresh herbs and that's it. Butter. Let's also talk, okay, butter. <laughs> butter is good. Butter, man, as I've gotten older, I just like have uh, learned more about the value of butter and ghee, like clarified butter. Um, what is your favorite fat to cook with? Bacon fat. Bacon fat. <laughs> you know, paired with the love of duck, that is not a bad thing. And duck fat actually is, is fantastic too. I I love cooking potatoes and duck fat, just nice and slow poached potatoes with duck fat. Oh yeah. Nice. So. I just roasted a chicken um coated in duck fat. I I you know I had to buy it, but um holy crap. It was really <laughs> good. I usually do it with with a bake with a bacon grease, but yeah, I the duck fat was something else. It was so good. Definitely. Yeah. And so um when you're kind of uh thinking about the infancy of what kind of we talked about, you know, <laughs> when you're a teenager or a kid and you fall into something, sometimes it's kind of like, Hey, I really like this. I'm just going to keep doing it. But, um, did your parents let you into the kitchen when you were a child at all? No. Oh. Yeah. Like I said, the first thing I ever made was a box of mac and cheese. and was just like, that's, <laughs> I don't know, but it's still like I put heat to food, you know, and it, it, I made something and I made it properly, I guess, to the box instructions, I guess, but I don't know. It just, it was, it just felt natural doing it. Okay. And you didn't have, and nobody was in your household saying, get out of the kitchen. You're not allowed in here. No, not at all. I, my mom entrusted me with a knife one time cutting a grapefruit and I cut a big chunk of my thumb as well, cutting it, you know, when I was probably eight, 10 years old, somewhere in there, <laughs> still have a scar. Yeah. yeah. But she lets you do it. And that's how you learn. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's just, I don't know, it's just always kind of come natural. I just, it's, it's yeah, you, you felt good about it from the beginning. I'm trying to think about, I think my very first job was picking strawberries in Washington State when I was 13. And we got paid by the flat. And, um, you know, like, not much because <laughs> I mean they would weigh it you know they would weigh your flat but um I think uh I love being outside and I only did it because I needed money and I didn't want to babysit so um I went to the strawberry fields of uh, Washington State and I didn't last that long I'm sure I didn't do it all summer but um you know, I, I still think about it really fondly because you're in this field of strawberries. It smells great. You're outside. You're messing around. By the end of the day, you're throwing strawberries at other people. Um, and you don't really care about how much money you're making. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, that, I really, as a job experience, that kind of reflects the stuff I still love, Kevin. <laughs> you know, I love being outside and I love food and <laughs> <laughs> being under a, a wide open sky and um, kind of sitting in the dirt, it wasn't a bad thing at all. And and it still affects me in a really positive way. Right. Awesome. And and you guys grow a lot of your own vegetables too. You were saying about Amelia doing the basil. There's other things among there that you're, that you're kind of. Um... I think this year, what do we have? We have some couple different kinds of peppers. I think we have like four different types of tomatoes, if not more. <laughs> uh, we have random squash seeds so we last year we got a couple of pumpkins and some butternut squash and some little mini uh, uh butternut squash and different kinds of just different squashes and we cleaned the seeds and threw them in a bag and we were like oh crap which one's which <laughs> so we planted them and so they're growing very nicely right now but we'll see what actually pops up and what what did we yeah. actually so but. So you've got some mystery squash growing this year. You know, I could never do um, zucchini all the way because I just want to. I just want to eat the, all the blossoms. Exactly. I know there's a couple big blossoms on there right now, and I wanted. I was looking at Amelia, and I was like, I want to stuff that with goat cheese and crab and deep fry it. And <laughs> oh my god, you are making me so hungry. 
<laughs> Stuff it with goat cheese and crab and deep fried. Okay, all the right words, Kevin. All the right words today. <laughs> <laughs> and so what are you enjoying most about i mean when you are home and not traveling what are you enjoying most about living in colorado you guys have um traveled a lot for a, a bit as a family um we're talking well kind of give me the rundown of where you've been job to job or state to state i mean we, obviously we love the outdoors you know we coming from victor and, and living here and just just tons of stuff to do out here you know there's there's farms all around us. There's two great farmers markets that are you know, in two miles of the house, you know, which are which are great, you know. Right. Uh, yeah, it's you know it, we moved here at a funny time because you know obviously I moved here and six months later COVID happened and so we were indoors for a long time, you know, and so <clears throat> so we didn't we haven't done as much as we wanted to here in Colorado. Right. That's that's changing, you know, this this summer. We've gone to a couple small towns, you know, there's there's tons and tons of small towns in Colorado. So we, we try to pick and choose, you know, and go to go to different places and and so that's that's a, always a fun fun thing to do. You know? Right. Well, I mean, Colorado is so enormous and there's a variety of growing seasons, really, because I mean, like for instance, the um southwest corner is so arid. Um, but then again, like if you get to Northern Colorado up near Fort Collins and then you're kind of North of Denver, um, yeah, there can be inclement weather, but geez, they can grow things almost all year round and outside and not, you know, leaning on greenhouses, like <laughs> these upper elevation people I'm surrounded by here. Um, but yeah, that's gotta be so gratifying to be able to find such fresh food all the time. Because, uh, every year the, the, the palisade peaches those are uh, they just they just run down your arm and you're, they're amazing they're yeah nice. and then i consider summer like grill a peach season because a grilled peach oh. absolutely so yeah. good talk about asian flavors you could put some sesame seeds on that that'd be good a little ginger some peach yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely that sounds so good so yeah, you're traveling now um, then today to Santa Fe and that's kind of a place that you love. You love the de desert Southwest and um, going to Virginia. Are you looking forward to that for any reason um, culinary wise or, you, or is that going to be a new experience for you? We, I went there, it was about a year and a half ago and I actually fell in love with Charlottesville. It's oh. A little town, little college town. Uh, I mean, fried chicken and collard greens that were in every restaurant was every single one of them was fantastic blew mine out of the water you know yeah <laughs> learn how to do this <laughs> so right and i love um you know again you're you're out there and you're traveling and you're creating your own culinary memories i mean you know, you know i think that you and i have both probably agree um the importance of food in our lives it's it's really a cultural experience but it's actually very individualized as a cultural experience. So it's not like across the board, everybody has the same experience, you know? Um, and maybe that's the charm of food. Maybe, maybe that's why um, the importance of it and, um, and how much it brings us together. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, your, your audio cut off. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Um, no, yeah, just people coming together. I mean, that's just, just like we were talking about earlier, you know, it's just every occasion, you know, there's food involved and it doesn't matter what culture you come from. It's, it's you're always, you're always surrounded with food, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it does, it kind of connects us as um, really broadly throughout for, for humanity who does connect us. And it's, it's sad how, um, how different we all feel um yeah. how 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 uh how opposed we are on so many levels when in fact there are so many things about how we live our daily lives that really bring us more together than we realize and one of those things is food <laughs> i mean i can't help but say it i think that um i don't know when you're sharing a meal with someone there's a lot of things you can set aside yeah definitely. especially if the food is really good 
And um, I want to mention another trick you taught me, uh, something about sticking a cookie sheet in the freezer and making potatoes. Did I do that one? I don't know if I told you that one. I think you did. Like, oh, did... Make a that... potato? Huh. Yeah. I think it was about like making chopped potatoes and like putting them in the oven. And before you do that, put your cookie sheet in the freezer. And I don't know. Huh. I'm not sure who told me that. And if I even do it anymore, I'm trying to think of things Kevin Walsh has taught me. <laughs> things I notice about what Kevin does. And now that may, may not have ever been Kevin. <laughs> but yeah, you came, um, you had guys had moved to Las Vegas and I still lived in Victor um, with my now ex-husband. And you came in an RV with your three kids. Yes. And then we had another couple from California, from Palm Springs, bring their triplets. <laughs> so in this cabin, um, kind of a cabin structure, you guys were living in the RV in the front. And I think Jill and Sean and the kids were in the basement, but there were six children in our house. And then there were six adults. <laughs> we had the best time. It was so good. And you cooked for us. And I'll never forget that. That's another... Yeah, I mean, I'll never forget those kids playing in the backyard. Those kids are, you know, close to graduating high school now. I mean, you're, you know, you've got children in your family driving vehicles, which I can't believe. <laughs> and I'm just really happy to be able to have that memory of you guys that summer when you um, spent that time with us. And, you know. That was a fun trip that we had there. But, yeah, just hanging out in the backyard, that was that was so much fun. Those kids were going crazy for hours <laughs> for hours <laughs> uh, i know and i think as a, as the group of adults are situated in in that whole um experience we just sat there and watched them let's just like run it off exactly. we're just yeah. sitting there having wine and being like yeah they're still going <laughs> so yeah. that was the, that was the best and um yeah i i don't know i think as we grow in age it's good to be able to look back on the things that are important to us and like how we've experienced life through our friend family and, you know, what that brings to the table of our lives, so to speak. And um, certainly knowing one another in friendship and in food also. Um, I want to mention too that <laughs> Kevin and Amelia name all their pets after food. I'm sorry? Kevin and Amelia name all their pets after food. Absolutely. Yep. So who who are the pets that are in your family now, Kevin? All right, right now we have we have a new little kitty, my cute little kitty. <laughs> We're not cat people, but I fell in love with this darn cat. <laughs> Her name is Chia. Okay. Uh, then we have Haggis, the big, big dumb Great Dane, or Great Dane Mastiff mix, actually. And Ooh. same with Zab. Zab is a uh, Zabaglion, the uh, the cream layer in the tiramisu. Okay. <laughs> so far, he's my favorite. Zab, yeah, he's, they're, they're both big and goofy, and we love them. Uh, uh, say it again. Zab Zabaglion. Zabaglion. <laughs> nice. And you've uh, had you've had an olive. Yep, we had olive, and then we had uh, Bagel the Beagle. He was awesome. <laughs> and I think our first pet we ever had as a couple, it was a... It was a leopard gecko. It was yellow, so we called him Mango. And we've had fish, and oh, we've had uh, bearded dragons as well. One was Porcini, and what was the other one? I can't remember the other. It was, it's been a little while, but uh, yeah. So every every pet has a has a food name. Yeah, love it. <laughs> yeah, and not every pet could be food, but mm, if you name a duck. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I would suggest naming it La Orange. <laughs> and ducks, and we had a geese when we were in uh, New Mexico. Oh, that's right. You did have a duck and geese. This uh, was uh, Couscous. Couscous. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. We were known as the the Great Dane and Goose people. We'd walk around town with the with the goose on a, on a leash, you know. And <laughs> with did the, the goose comply? Surprisingly, yes. Yes. They are like attack dogs. <laughs> <Sometimes>. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was wondering about what a goose might taste like the other day. And um, my point I was making was, you know, the last time we heard about a goose as a meal was like a Charles Dickens novel. So it can't be that good. <laughs> it just can't be. <laughs> Give me a duck in it. <laughs> exactly. I, Get the duck in there. And I, again, I'm with ducks. Let's just go back for a second because the duck egg, okay. I have had um, like secret plans to one day have enough ducks to just be able to walk along and pick up eggs because they don't necessarily lay them like chickens. They don't go, they'll kind of just randomly drop them. Not as consistent, definitely. Right. And then um, ducks are louder than chickens, but they're also hardier. So they don't get a lot, the same kind of mites and Chickens are really prone to those kinds of things. I don't know. Maybe someday, Kevin, we got to start the commune, dude. I, I need enough property to have ducks. And clearly some of those are going to be meals, right? Not just <laughs> eggs. Let me know when. <laughs> yeah, let me know when. I mean, we're just going to have to go back to Los Alamos. <laughs> Wide open spaces there. Well, safe travels to you this afternoon. Um, have a wonderful time on your trip. And I hope that uh, everything um, with what you're doing right now, you seem to really love it. And I, I love hearing about um, how much you still enjoy the gratifying nature of, you know, of the food experience and um, bringing people together. Yeah, it's, yeah, we're going to keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Yeah, I just can't get enough of it. You know, I, <laughs> I go, I work, cook all day. I come home, cook at night. <laughs> I'm cooking channel on at, at night. <laughs> Dreaming about what my next foods, next day's food's going to be. You know, that's just, that's just how I roll. That's how I. Right. I love like living the immersive food experience <laughs> for sure. <laughs> on, on an excellent and delicious level. And um, all of this just reminds me of how much I need to, Maybe consider coming back to visit you and maybe even get adopted. <laughs> <laughs> you can train me to be the next chef in the Walsh family, the next uh, sous chef at least. Like, I don't want to shoot too high, I'm kind of old. <laughs> I'll take Sue. <laughs> Advanced Pretend is a podcast produced by Nine Stories Creative Podcast Studios, created by Jen Ryan, executive produced and edited by Matt Jackson. Find us wherever you get your podcasts.